and it's going to be a... Thank you. We, we, we talked about diabetic retinopathy quite a bit, so I'm going to change the tack a little bit and talk about retinal imaging and clinical practice, uh, and a little bit about artificial intelligence as it is coming in uh, over the time. So my disclosures. Uh, so talking about macular degeneration, I'm sure we all use the clinical assessment of the patient first, and helped by the OCT and often with retinal angiography, both at diagnosis of macular degeneration at the outset, as well as when we're considering further management of the patient as we go along with the treatment. So when you look at the patient in clinic, you look for the signs of wet macular degeneration in particular, you look for the hemorrhages, you look for the exudates, swelling in the retina, and if you do the OCT scan, you look for certain features such, such as intra or subretinal fluid. You look for what is called SRAM or subretinal hyperreflective material, pigment epithelial detachments, and whatnot. Often, and in UK, it's a standard practice to have a baseline fluorescein angiogram that would confirm the presence or absence of your choroidal new vascular membrane. We tend to use both fluorescein and ICG angiography together because it gives us more details about the choroidal circulation, in particular for the cases with IPCV. But do we really need a retinal angiogram in our clinical practice? Now, of course, when you look at the OCT, there are certain features that do tell you that the patients would have wet macular degeneration, such as the subretinal or intraretinal fluid, the SRAM, pigment epithelial detachment, and whatnot, and that correlates quite often with the fluorescein angiogram where you see the coronal vascular network as uh, on the picture on your left. But what is the sensitivity and specificity of the OCT, and OCT on its own? So if you do an OCT, the sensitivity is quite high, usually in the 90% uh, range, but the specificity is quite low. So it's not very specific to wet macular degeneration as such, the changes that we have just seen. In uh, a large um, systemic um, review done for the NIHR in UK, they found the sensitivity and specificity for OCT for diagnosis is quite good. 88% and 78% sensitivity, quite good. But when it comes to monitoring the disease after you've given a few injections, the sensitivity remains good but the specificity drops down to 48%. So that's a bit like tossing the coin. You can get it right half the time. What is useful, however, is to know what exactly is, is seen on the OCT. So we need to know the nomenclature and the layers on, seen on the retina. And especially in the cases of age-related macular degeneration, we are more interested in changes seen in subretinal tissue, especially in the choroid, and deep uh, assessment of the choroid, though it's a bit limited with the OCT, it's still possible with the newer technology. What's more interesting for us now is that the, as the OCT technology is improving, faster scans are possible, and when the faster and faster scans are possible, you can use the computing methods to deduct uh, the static changes on the OCT versus changes that change with time, such as the flow. And by doing that, you can have the map of retinal tissue as well as retinal vasculature on the OCT angiography. So we in UK set out to do a study based on OCT angiography a couple of years back, and we're reporting the results at the ARVO in a couple of months' time. Based on uh, that study and further experience, I'm going to share some of the, uh, the knowledge that we have acquired. The OCTA now is quite useful. I use quite regularly in clinical practice in my cases uh, for macular degeneration. At diagnosis, it helps to phenotype the patients and helps us to study the morphology of the disease. It also helps in the management. Though we don't have the quantitative data, qualitative data certainly helps us to improve our understanding of treatment response, uh, but we need to learn a lot more. So we need to collect a lot more images and base uh, our judgment on that for the final uh, say on whether the OCT angiography would be really helpful or not. So I'm going to share a couple of cases here with you uh, using the OCT angiography 
at diagnosis. The first is what we call type 1 CNV. Type 1 CNV, if you remember, is the occult CNV, as it used to be called, which is subepithelial um, outside the retina. And you can see here, the picture on your right shows at the network seen uh, in the deeper layer of the retina. The map below that, um, this one here, shows the yellow um, demarcation at the bottom, which is the flow uh, identified by the computing program. That also is quite useful when you assess the OCT angiography images. Here is another example. This is type 2 uh, CNV, which is called classic CNV in previous uh, terminology. And you can see most of the changes are above the RPE. And, and you can see the fluorescein angiogram on, the, on your left, which clearly shows um, what is easily identifiable as a lacy network of uh, new vessels, which leak later on in the, in the frame. And the picture on your right at the top shows three layers of the retina identified by the program. And the far right, farthermost on the right at the top shows the network of the blood vessels, which is spot on in the center of the macula, which was seen on the fluorescein angiogram. So it correlates quite well with the fluorescein angiography. When it comes to identifying the type 3 CNV, which is the retinal angiometrous proliferation, it's a bit more problematic. Uh, because the flow here in the blood vessels, the new blood vessels, is vertical rather than horizontal. And hence, you need to look at the, the map itself, which is the picture at the bottom, and look for those yellow uh, pixels, identify the program in the vertical fashion. In some cases, however, if you're lucky, you can find that horizontal uh, distribution of the wrap as seen in this picture here. As I mentioned about the OCT itself, the sensitivity of identifying CNV, it, it, it varies depending on which paper you look at, but it's still in about 70%, you can see it. But when you combine the OCT and OCTA together, both the sensitivity and specificity increases to about 85 to 90% in most of the studies. Um, we looked at our own data and we find that it is about 90, 90 95% sensitivity and specificity when you use OCT and OCTA together in identifying the patients with CNV in our macular clinics. What about follow-ups? Now that becomes a bit more problematic. What we tend to see is when you treat patients with anti-VEGF injections, Lucentis, um, ILEA, or Evastin, you would find that the blood vessels shrink and the classic um, Medusa uh, appearance disappears and you find that you, you see more of the trunks of the blood vessels rather than the branching pattern at the tips of the blood vessels. Something that is described as unraveled yam, uh, the picture on the right there. Um, it's quite interesting that you can quantify the changes as well. Quite often you would see that the blood vessels area under the uh, retina slowly improves i.e. that is reduced with further injections. But in some cases, you also find that even after regular injections, overall area of the retinal choroidal vasculature increases after the loading dose of injections. So that is why I think it is important that further studies are done on using the OCT angiography in clinical practice and in further research as well to identify its particular role in the management of that uh, age-related macular degeneration. Uh, so there are quite a few limitations of um, OCT angiography, especially with patients with poor cooperation. Uh, patient needs to keep the eye still, otherwise you get lots of artifacts. There are projection artifacts that are seen at times. Furthermore, when we talked about diabetic retinopathy, it's quite useful, but it only picks up the blood flow that is fast enough that the, the program can identify. So some of the microaneurysms, for example, in diabetic retinopathy may not be picked up by the OCT angiography. Um, a brief word about OCT, um, artificial intelligence. Now we all, as doctors, use um, our own judgment using various in information sources that we have available to us, starting from the history of the patient and then using certain clinical biomarkers to come to a conclusion about patient diagnosis and then plan the management as well. So clinical biomarkers that we've been using 
uh, based on technology assistance, whether it be the blood test, um, the imaging that we do, OCT, OCT angiography, or our fundus photography. Professor Manon talked about the diabetic screening program where retinal images are done, and that's where the technology came in first, where uh, neural networks were used assessing the 2D images of retinal pictures, identifying presence or absence of diabetic retinopathy. So the computers can automatically can do that. That's been in practice for quite a while. Say, for example, in Scotland, the primary grading for retinopathy, presence or absence of retinopathy, has been done by computers for a while. But that's the simple um, assessment. Now, multiple information sources can be pulled together, and that gives even better uh, information about the patient diagnosis. And that is what is used for machine learning. So machines, the computers are fed a wealth of data. Thousands and thousands of images are given to the computers to assess, but they need to be told what is seen on the, on the, on the images. Otherwise, the computers do, do not have brain of their own. Um, our group in Moorfields had presented this paper very recently, later last year, that was based on using the OCT data that collected at Moorfields, thousands of images, again, marked by the clinicians to show certain changes on the OCT angiography, or OCT scans, and then the computers were gradually learned, machine learning, that allowed them to come to an algorithm used by the Google DeepMind and it's been said now that the computers the, can, using this software program, can identify a lot of retinal conditions quite often better than the clinicians can do. So the artificial intelligence is something that we can, we can look forward to uh, using in a clinical practice. Not only in retina, in glaucoma field as well, that's going to be application of uh, artificial intelligence that would aid the doctors in their further assessment and management of, of the cases going forwards. So in conclusion, I think there is a developing new field both in retinal imaging. I only touched on certain aspects of retinal imaging. Uh, autofluorescence uh, is another area that we can talk about at, an, at the next meeting maybe. There is exciting developments happening in field of artificial intelligence, which is going to help us all in our clinical practice in future. Thank you very much.